Okay, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians across the state and across the country, depending on our topics. Um, we do these sessions live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. And they are recorded, however, so if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can pop over to our website and see recordings of all of our sessions that we've ever done on the show, going back to the beginning. Um, and we do all sorts of things on here, um, presentations, interviews, mini training sessions, um, whatever, anything. If it's related to libraries, we'll put it on the show. We're not very picky. <laughs> that's about as picky as we get. Are you library related? Sure. Um, and we have um, guest speakers that come on sometimes, but we also have commission staff that do things too. And that's actually what we have today, a whole team of commission people here um, that are going to talk to us this morning about the Nebraska Legislators Database, there we go. Uh, doo -doo -doo, let me get on my page here, which I'll actually let you guys explain what that is. It, it sounds kind of self-explanatory to me, but you know, figuring out what it's all about and what's in there. Um, we have, um, and I'm not sure what order they're going to do things, but I'll just, Alana Novotny, Beth Goble, and Mary Sowers are all here, and I'll let them introduce themselves and talk about what they're all doing with this um, during their presentation. So I'm just going to move the microphone over to you guys, and you can okay, thanks. whoever's here. Krista, I'm, I'm going to start off. This is Beth Goble, and then we're going to we're going to kind of go round robin here uh, after that. So. Um, as you can see, Krista is showing you the Nebraska Access website, which I think you're familiar with. And um, what we're talking about today is Nebraska legislators past and present. And it is a new database that we have added to Nebraska Access. So uh, you probably know that anything that's on our Nebraska Access site is intended for use by the public, not solely by librarians, although we hope librarians will be interested in this one too. So um, first off, we'll uh, just go to the new website. and. You can get there uh, by searching. So Alana is driving for me today because I'm hopeless at trying to talk and navigate at the same time. So I don't know if you can tell, but she's just typing in the word legislators. And other words like senator, if you knew that we call them state senators, other words would also bring it, it up. So uh, we're going to go to that third link down, which says Nebraska legislators past and present. So I'll just start off by telling you a little bit about why we did this. Um, we get asked reference questions here at the Library Commission uh, about the Nebraska legislature in its various incarnations uh, fairly often. Sometimes it's a genealogist who has a name of a family member and they want to get some verification that that person served in the legislature. And what we used to have to do was hope that they gave us at least some kind of a date or that they had the person's name, and that we would go to the Nebraska Blue Books to search for that information because there are lists in the Nebraska Blue Books of who served in the different Nebraska legislatures. And you know, if we couldn't find the person, then we would email back and say, I'm so sorry, we didn't find your relative. So we didn't know of any other resource that would bring all of it together because the lists were obviously print resources and they uh, there would be a list for the territorial legislature, there would be a list for the bicameral legislature, and one for the unicameral legislature. So what, what we hoped was someday to, get, to find a way to just make a searchable way to find this. So a number of years ago uh, we were provided by, by, with a document that had been prepared by the Legislative Research Division of the unicameral. And they had created a list of all of the senators who had served in the unicameral from 1937 to the present. And this was you know, a few years ago. And it also listed the district that they had served in and dates of the legislative journal that you could find information about them. So we were able to turn that into a spreadsheet and then create uh, the precursor to what you see today as a, a little website where you could search by district and you could search by name just in the unicameral to find somebody. But the goal was always to try and, and make a database that was easier to search, had more ways to search, and would list everybody from 1855, which is when our territorial legislature began, to the present day. So that's kind of how we got this project done. Uh, it took several years <laughs> and lots of editing to take the lists from the Blue Book. Uh, Alana, who's 
going to be talking to you in a minute, uh, did the yeoman's work in creating uh, the spreadsheets and a lot of editing work needed to be done. And they, they were all combined into one spreadsheet. You don't need all this detail. And then our computer wizard, Vern Bias, turned it into a database. So at this point, um, can you think of anything else I should say at this point? I'd like to just, uh, you, I notice our audience is all from Nebraska, so you know we've had three legislators. Jurors, oh. but yeah, I know we may have others watching it later. Mm -hmm. We've had the territorial legislature met from 1855 to 1867. The bicameral legislature, which was more like was like all the other state legislatures, two houses, um, met from 1866. I know there's some overlap, and we'll talk about that later. Until 1937, and since 1937, we have we're the only state in the union that has a one-house unicameral legislature, and it is nonpartisan. We'll talk more about that later. So now I'd like to ask Mary Sowers, and by the way, she is our new government documents librarian here at the Library Commission, um, working on the information resources team, services team. And Mary's going to do some searching for you, so you can see how it works. Good morning, everyone. First of all, before we begin uh, demonstrating uh, various search strategies that you can use with the database, um, I would like to invite our audience to um, type in your current state senator's name, if you happen to know it, um, your district number, if you know it, um, possibly what county um, you live in, or someone uh, specific that you would like us to search for um, at a later point during the show. If you'll just go ahead and type those in, we'll get those and eventually we will uh, look for those for you. Um, to get started with the um, searching in the database, um, first of where it's supposed to be here. Um, our first box is name box. And one thing I do want to point out here um, are the instructions out to the side of the box that indicate last name or last and first name. Um, you will notice that first name only is not indicated here. Uh, first name only actually works better if you put it um, in the free text box. But starting with the uh, just the basic name box, um, I'm going to I, I just picked some names at random as I was doing some research for this. And uh, one of the names I um, came up with was uh, Car... Car... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. What did I do? hit search or something. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies. Was um, Carpasek. And I'm going to uh, just type in his name as a last name and hit search. And there are our results for Russ Carpasek. He... Um, is District 32 in the unicameral, uh, so he is current from 2007 to date. Yeah, so that is one search strategy. Now if we go back to that same page, um, notice originally I did just the last name, and that works with any of the names. Or if you happen to know the person's full name, uh, you can type in Karpasek, uh, comma, Russ, and again, same results. But if you don't know how to spell someone's last name, you can do a truncated version. So if I put in K-A-R, we do come up with quite a few names that have K-A-R in them. But you can see that our guy in District 32 does come up, um, Russ Carpasek. So lots of different ways that you can um, type in or uh, type in names to find what you want. Um, another uh, name that I came across that might be familiar to people is Chris Butler, who's the currently the mayor of Lincoln. He comes up. He served in uh, District 28 uh, while he was part of the legislature. Um, again, if you don't know how to spell his last name, you can put in B-E-U, and he comes up. But if you have no idea how to spell his name, and this is transitioning over to the free text,
but you do know that his first name is Chris, you can put that in. And yes, it will bring up every name that has Chris in it, either first name or in the last name. But um, the third one down is Chris Butler. So lots of different ways that you can find names. Now, um, other ways that you can use the name, uh, if you happen to know the entire name, for example, um, if we want to do um, Terry Carpenter and find out what his history is. Um, it, and that's the great thing about this database is you can find out the history of the different districts or you can find out a specific senator's history within the legislature. Terry has actually served in two different districts. From 1965 to uh, 74, he served in uh, District 48, and had, before that, served in District 42. So um, a lot of you may remember um, Terry Carpenter as uh, Terry, ter uh, Terrible Terry Carpenter. <laughs> Terry, um, I yes. just want to point out that when you're talking about district, you are referring to the unicameral district. That is correct. Point. Yes, at this point I am referring to the unicameral districts. Okay. Now, I also did a search um, for my own uh, senator. And again, I'm going to do this uh, in free text. Um, I did search for um, District 27. Now, and this is a complete listing of everything in uh, everyone who has served in District 27. And currently, um, based on looking at the different years, uh, terms of office, uh, Colby Coash is the current senator for my part of, and I, I do live in Lincoln, so Colby Coash is my senator for uh, that area of Lincoln. Other ways that you can um, search in free text, you can also uh, search by town. So if I were to type in the uh, town Red Cloud, it brings up everyone whose residence was in Red Cloud <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, throughout the history uh, of the legislature, um, and starting with C.R. Bess, uh, who's bicameral uh, House and Senate. Uh, we have unicameral, so this is uh, comprehensive. Now, Mary, I would just add to that that um, throughout the history of the since we've been a state uh, for the territorial legislature you'll be searching by some by county. That is correct. Rather than a yes. place name. That is correct. And I do believe sometimes we only have residents listed as county. We do not actually have their town of residence on the bicameral. Yes. So that is correct yeah, as well. Yes. Yeah. Lots yeah. Of searching, <laughs> let's just say geographic searching is challenging. And that's it really has to do with the way they were listed in the in the blue books. That is correct. And uh, just the way their representation was was recorded. Really explain what it took what two years to get this done and uh, <laughs> oh, at least two years. Yes, <laughs> like four, We're not gonna say how many years. Right. <laughs> okay, and so other free text um, terms that we can use. Um, I'm going to actually save until a little bit later um, just to do some fun things. But uh, the other thing that I wanted to, to point out about uh, searching first names is that uh, since they don't work in the regular name box, you can um, type them into the free text. So for example, um, by typing in, and I think I mentioned this with uh, Chris Butler's name, but if, you, if I were to type in Barnabas, um, and you know that we had a Barnabas as a legislator, but it doesn't come up in the name box, um, try it again in the free text, and um, you can see that we had a Barnabas Bates who served in the Territorial uh, Council and House in the Territorial Legislature. Um, very quickly, 
just to show you how these work, because I know Beth and Elena are going to be uh, touching on these as well. Um, the unicameral district, if you uh, click on the drop-down box and click on a district number and search, it will give you a history of that district um, in the unicameral. Yeah. And I don't know if you noticed the difference if you were watching before. This time it's sorting it in in uh, date order. That is With correct. the most recent first. When Mary did the other search, uh, it was in alphabetical order. When she did the free text search yes. uh, for Chris Beitler, it was, it was showing up uh, alphabetically. So just a, a little bit different in the way the database works. And it does show you on the screen there, um, next to your search, how it is being sorted so you can clearly see that. Go back to 19 since that was the one we were looking at. I clicked on um, 19 in the drop-down box, but when I actually put in District 19 in the uh, free text, she is right, it, it comes up alphabetically. Um, in the drop-down, it is by date, starting with uh, 1937. And there is a reason for that, as we've had that question, people wanting a list kind of from beginning to end of everyone who served in a particular unicameral district. Correct. Okay, uh, moving on to the next one. This is a list of the territorial counties. Um, one that I found of most interest was uh, La Okikur, uh, which became Knox County uh, once the, in um, 1873. This is a list of everyone who uh, represented Lokikur County in order of date. Now one thing that I did notice um, is that John Taff appears several times and it depends on what year he served. Uh, like, for example, here, he was in 1859 in the Territorial House, but in 1860, he was in the Territorial County. And so, council. Uh, council. My apologies. And um, he appears again in 1861 as part of the Territor Territorial Council. So, if, if that part looks confusing, just remember that this, when you've uh, looked at it, particular territorial county, it will be in date order. Okay. And then the last drop down very quickly um, is the different bodies. If you would like a history of the unicameral, uh, the bicameral house, the bicameral senate, the territorial house, or just the territorial council. Um, if you were to click on uh, those, those will give you histories, which um, Beth and Atlanta are going to be talking about now. And I'll be back with you in a few minutes to hopefully do some more searches. Okay, I think at this point, um, <laughs> as I said, I make Alana drive for me. If you just scroll down to that link, the, the link at the bottom here, this is uh, a link to all kinds of information. If you're interested in more than just searching or you need some more help with how to search, we've provided uh, some longer explanation about those three legislatures uh, for you. And first off, I'm going to just talk about um, the trans, the territorial legislature, right? I'm going to let Alana, I should say, talk mm -hmm. about the territorial legislature, and then you'll hear from me later. Well, hello, hello everybody. Um, as Beth mentioned, I am going to talk about the territorial legislature. Um, as you see here, the date span of this legislature was from 1855 to 1867. Uh, just to give you a touch of uh, background, the in uh, or I keep wanting to say 19 in 1854 uh, is when the Kansas Nebraska Act was put into effect, and at that same time, then what they call the Ag Organic Act also took place, and this is what was used to set up the first uh, territorial legislative assembly in the state. Um, I won't read everything here, that, but that's on the screen. You can do that at a later time, of course. Um, 
The first Legislative Assembly, though, actually did meet in Omaha in January 16, 1855, and they adjourned on March 16, 1855. That always surprises me because I can't figure out why would you want to meet in Nebraska during those months, in January, yeah. <laughs> in January February, but well, March. But because you weren't doing much on the farm then. That probably. is true. You're probably right about that. But um, this first legislative, the territorial one, is made up of two house or two bodies: the House and the Council. Um, the Council has 13 members and is elected for two-year terms, while the House of Representatives initially had 26 members. Um, and they were elected for one year. Now the number of people in the House have changed over the time of between that 1855 and 1867 date. Uh, let's see here. Um, let me jump back a second. And I do want to point out the, one of the ways to search for people that have served in the territorial, as Mary pointed out here, she stole one of my examples already, so <laughs> that's okay. Um, you can see here we do have a list of territorial counties, and I'm going to repeat myself just making sure you realize that is only the territorial counties because um, that's where we do have consistent information about counties. Um, you will see county information appear in some of the bicameral entries. However, we don't consistently have that information for the bicameral, so this is limited to the territorial. Um, also, if you look through the list here, you can see it's a little shorter than the, the county list we have currently today. And as you look through the list, you may find some counties that uh, you don't recognize. Uh, obviously, there was the Lockheed Court, or however you pronounce that. My uh, French isn't... <laughs> Yeah, isn't that great? So um, there's also Forney, Green, let's see, Jones, Monroe. I think that's all of them. Um, I do want to point out that if you scroll down here a bit, We do have a little bit of searching tips, and one of the things we do have is learn more about the counties. And we just put together a brief page that gives you an idea a little bit about some of the counties and how they changed. Um, but obviously I missed Calhoun there because that's the first one listed. And I do cite this information that I, um, this, most of this information did come uh, from a book about Nebraska history by Harrison Johnson. And it is actually available full text online through the Google Books. So if you actually want to read the, the book, it's there. Um, you can see I have noted things like Calhoun County, um, was, now it's called Saunders. Uh, Forney is Nemaha. Green is Seward. Uh, Jones County, I will let you read the description yourself later on. But... Um, just Jones County is a little interesting because you can see here in the last line the former Jones in the divorcement retaining the name of Jess Jefferson and the former Jefferson County assuming the name Thayer. So try to keep track of how they switch Thayer and Jefferson and Jones around is kind of interesting. I love that word divorcement. Too. <laughs> <laughs> and as Mary mentioned, um, the name was changed to Knox County in Monroe. Monroe. And the other one I wanted to point out here that I noted was Clay County. Um, most of you are probably aware of the fact there actually is a Clay County today. However, the Clay County we are talking about at this time period in 1864 and 55 is um, not the Clay County we know of today. This Clay County was actually located between Lancaster and Gage County. And it was actually divided in half with the land going half to Lancaster and half to Gage County. Um, and I did find a map, um, Coltrane's Kansas and Nebraska map from 1858. And I've already just brought that open here so I didn't have to wait for it to load. So here you can see the map, as I mentioned, from 1855. I'm just going to zoom in a bit so you can see some of the county names. So if you go down here to the bottom, you can see um, here is that Clay County I mentioned sitting directly between Lancaster and Gage. Um, there's the Jones County that I mentioned and how the Jones and Jefferson and switch names and all that fun stuff. Um, 
can see there's Greene County. And I did notice on this map, Greene County is spelled G-R-E-E-N-E -E -E with an E on the end. And everything I've looked at in the Nebraska Blue Books um, does not have that final E on the end. So I don't know which one's right or wrong, but I left everything without the E since that's the way um, it is in all the Blue Books. Now, this, this map, you had this already open, this map. Do I, we have links from our the database yep. to these so that people it's can right there. just jump over? And, oh, okay, cool. I just love those old maps. I was very just curious. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the link is right there. I just didn't want to wait to it open. Um, go up a little farther here. There's the Lucky Core. Now, if you're up on your shapes of Nebraska counties, you can see some of these. I know Dixon has changed, Cumming has changed. Um, I know a few others of these have changed slightly. Most of them, I think, are in roughly the same spot. But it's obvious, like I said, some of them definitely have shifted a bit, for the lack of a better term. So let me jump back over here again. Um, and I'm going to go back to the search page. Um, I probably, I'll just do a quick search. If it's pretty obvious here, if, you know, you just select the county, as Mary was saying before, and do your search. And you can see that there was three people that served in the Green County. And that's because then, you know, the name changed to Seward. So um, when that name change happened in 62, of course, we don't have anybody showing up in the database after 1861. I'm going to go back to the Learn More About Nebraska Legislatures page that Beth pointed out earlier. And there's a few other links in this text here that I wanted to make sure I pointed out. I'm microphone closer to you. It's not picking up as well. It's Okay, is that better? Um, let's see, we mentioned the territory account is already. The other link here I wanted to point out is from the Nebraska Blue Book of 1915. Um, this is actually talks about the Nebraska legislative apportionments. I always want to say appointments, so if I say that wrong, oh. please correct me. <laughs> <laughs> um, apportionment makes me think of a piece of or how do they cut it up? Very good. Thank you for that definition. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am not going to read this full document. Obviously, it's a nine-page document. And this actually covers how as best as Nebraska was cut into pieces and how the different um, people were selected from across the state. Uh, you can see this document actually covers 1854 to 1911. And it starts out, you know, with the Organic Act and how it was done. Um, it, during the time of the territorial legislation, there was actually, um, the apportionments were changed five different times. Um, it does note in here that in 1855, one of the changes was done because there was actually five new counties added. Um, it sounds like some of their things were questions at a point in time because it, this is, you know, at one point in time, the, government, the governor did the apportionments, and people were not happy about what happened. And as you read this document, you will notice through the years, they start talking about uh, North Platte and South Platte. Those are not actually towns. Um, here's a table that shows, again, how the senators and house were appointed between the North and the South. And I think I did mention this does cover both the territorial and part of the bicameral but I'm just going to talk about it all now. Um, keep scrolling down here. Again, there will be a map here towards the end. And you can see they kind of divide the state in half, left and right. And then here you go. Here you can see the North Platte, or the Platte River going across the state. And then not, this is how they talk about the North Platte and then the South Platte. And this one reminded me of today. It's the interstate. You talk about being north of the interstate or south of the interstate, which doesn't completely follow the Platte River. But that, I found this document an interesting read if you want to know more about how this all took place and what was involved and 
how it changed you know, over the years during that uh, time period. And then the last document I want to point to for the territorial uh, is, again, this is from the 1915 Blue Book. And in the Blue Book here, we actually found a list of all of the 12 legislative sessions that took place in the territorial uh, House and Council. And it actually goes so far to show and tell you here so here's the 4th Legislative Assembly. Now it does actually tell you what counties were represented and who represented that county. And I kind of have noticed, obviously, as I told you, the apportionment has changed over time. You will see, as you kind of look through here, it's kind of easy to see that, okay, at one point in time you had multiple people representing these counties, and then sometimes you only had one person representing a slightly different county grouping. I found this kind of a fascinating document to look at. I believe that's all I had about the territorial. Do you anything to add or else I'll let Beth talk about the transition then from a territory to a bicameral. Okay. And you can see we're, we're just microphone. following along and elaborating a little bit on this, this page um, that we're going through. So, that there's the transition to statehood part. And the reason that we put that in there at all is because we thought it might be confusing to searchers that they're going to find people serving in the same year in two different legislatures. And, and why did that happen? Well, what happened was, is it, you know, kind of in, in preparation for statehood, um, Nebraska voters did adopt uh, a constitution for the soon-to-be-formed state of Nebraska. And it provided for a state legislature that would have two houses, um, and they, they were going to call it the Senate and the House of Representatives, which is pretty standard for most states. They went ahead and met on July 4th, and, uh, 1866, thinking that that would be the last time they met. And, that, um, it, and you see that that's listed as the first state legislative session. So what actually happened was that um, Nebraska hadn't become a state yet, and uh, it was Congress that had to uh, pass the bill for statehood for Nebraska. Well, when they took a look at this constitution uh, that had been voted on by the people in Nebraska, it didn't make any provision for African Americans or black people as they were, whatever they were probably called Negroes back then. Um, there wasn't any provision in there for them to vote, but uh, of course the Civil War was over and uh, they were citizens by then. So, at any rate, Congress then rejected that Constitution and said, oh no, you know, you're not going to become a state until you do something to fix that Constitution. So that was when um, there was another session held um, of the territorial legislature in 1867, and it, immediately, it adjourned and immediately the governor called a session of the state legislature, the bicameral legislature, and this gets really confusing. Their task was to address the problem with the Constitution. Uh, they met again, uh, so you have, it just means, you, you can read the whole thing for yourself, but it just means that you have both the territorial legislature and the state legislature meeting uh, in the same years for, during this transition period. They fixed the Constitution, uh, they went ahead and, and met in February of 1867, but the truth is our statehood day is March 1st of 1867, so they actually did meet three times that state legislature before we were officially a state. And so if you're ever doing research and that's, that's why you see these first three sessions listed in years when we weren't officially a state yet. And that's probably enough to say about that. Uh, Alana is going to go, now going to talk some more about the state bicameral legislature for us. Thanks Beth for the transition there and to statehood. I'm, I'm, I'm still confused about it. And I, <laughs> just, just read what it says there if you really care. But you're, you know, the guy you're looking for, or sooner or later it's going to be a woman, you may find them showing up and there are notes in uh, some of these to, to indicate that somebody served in both legislatures, but you may find that the years overlap and that's why. 
as Beth mentioned, I want to talk about the um, bicameral legislature then. As she also mentioned, then we have um, both the Senate and the House. Um, initially, there were 13 senators, 13, yeah, 13 senators and 39 representatives. Um, again, that document about apportionment I talked about earlier does go into and starts covering through some of this bicameral time, but I won't take the time to open that, obviously, again. Um, when it comes to searching the bicameral uh, time period, I, I feel like we have the least amount of options, obviously, for this. Um, you can op use the free text and name search, of course, but then the only other option to, li to see a list of who is in the bicameral House or Senate is to use just the drop-down um, option to see all the bicameral House or bicameral Senate members. And basically the reason for this is because of the information we have, there's no really good way to pull out any other search options at this point in time. Um, you can see here, as we mentioned earlier, this is being sorted by term of office. And as Beth mentioned, you can see here we do show that this first gentleman on the list here, he was in the Territorial Council, he was in the House, and he was also in the Bicameral House. Um, so this is just a long list by date. And I just kind of want to point out the fact that we start out here with counties representative, represented, and we have a list. Um, if I would go down quite a ways down the list here, um, now you can start seeing we have residents. We do not no longer have that county information. So like I said, um, it, it makes it hard to pull out and make a specific search for this because of the difference of information and how things have changed over the years. Uh, I know we just listed as residents here as I was looking in, in for more information in some of the blue books. Um, I'm kind of starting to wonder if really the residence is really not the town they lived in as opposed to where their post office box was. Mm -hmm. Because I have seen that in some of the blue books saying, you know, uh, it wasn't, you know, town where they lived, it was post office. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, something we'll have well, to put to our to-do list to do a little more Yeah, and that, I think searching. that carries over even into the unit camera era because if you were to search, um, you know, our former legislator, Deb Fisher, if you were to search her, it would give her residence as Valentine. Well, mm -hmm. she doesn't live in Valentine. She lives on a ranch in the county that Valentine is in. Mm -hmm. But her post office box is probably Valentine. Hard to say. So it's, as we said, <laughs> geographic searching is challenging. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing I'm wanted to point out is that I have started seeing information where there was some type of districts that were going on in the bicameral area, but we never, in the list of information we had, we did not get that information broken down. I have seen some of it now again in another blue book. Um, I'm not sure if we will ever take the time to go back and add that to the database just because of the amount of time involved. That's a whole other conversation. Um, I know we have over 3,700 people in this database just to give you an idea of how many records we're talking about dealing with. Um, I am going to go back. Oh, I should mention just most of you probably already know this, but there's always, when you are looking at one of these longer lists, um, you can always just do a control F and do a find on the page. So if you are looking for something, you know, specific, you can then just search the information um, that is being displayed. Yes, I believe there are thousands in the state by camera list. Yeah, so, so. it'll take you a while to scroll through them all. I am going to go back now and do a search on a particular person's last name. And this is a last name Gillespie. And I just wanted to point out here, Miss Mabel Gillespie from Gretna. She served in the bicameral house from 1925 to 1935. So if you note those dates, 25 to 35, uh, I want to go back and I want to point out another resource we have available here. 
their brief biographies of the legislatures. As you can see now, these, um, what one of us past staff member has done here at the commission has gone to the different blue books and has scanned the biographies that appear in the different blue books. And so I'm going to go to the 1926 blue book. Um, I know that uh, Ms. Maybell started, Mrs. Maybell started actually serving in 25, but from looking at these, I know that the 1926 book actually lists the 1925 um, senators and legislators. And these documents have been OCR, so you should be able to do a search and find Ms. Maybell here. And I just wanted to point her out because she's actually the first woman in Nebraska to take the oath of office in the state legislature. So I thought that was kind of interesting. But then, and as I was... So you can see what party they're from. Mm -hmm. But the thing I did note that was kind of interesting, um, I did do a search, obviously, but the pictures, the names are written in kind of a cursive writing here, so the OCR didn't pick them up. Let me jump to page here. I'm jumping here to page six, and as I was looking through this, I thought, oh, uh, you know, Abel here was the first person they said sworn in, but if you keep going, you can find there's Clara, <laughs> and there is actually, um, let's see, Sarah, and she's on page right here. So the only thing I can figure out is that Maybell, her district number is the lowest of the three. So, so she was sworn in first, <laughs> even though there was three women elected that year. So I just thought that was kind of interesting. Well, I am going to turn this back over to Beth now. Okay. And she can transition us into the unicameral. Okay, and I think um, we're talking to Nebraskans today, but for any of you that um, aren't from Nebraska, uh, there's lots of information out out there on how we came to have the only unicameral legislature in the country. Uh, interest in this started uh, actually back as early as 1913, but it really didn't go anywhere. Uh, and I think, personally, I think a large part of that was that there was a vested interest on the part of all the uh, people serving in the bicameral legislature, where there were as many as 100 in the House of Representatives, and you know, uh, what did we end up with? 39? 43, maybe. Anyway, we had the senators as well. Uh, if you think about having a, a unicameral legislature that's nonpartisan, you're going to take away some, how do I put this, vested interest on part of, <laughs> of quite a few people in having a job doing this and having a lot of influence. So I think, personally, that's why it didn't really go anywhere. But Nebraskans probably all know about Senator George Norris. He was a great statesman in our state. He had served in the House of Representatives and then was a U.S. Senator. And in the 1930s, he got involved. He was a great proponent of this uh, concept that he felt that there would, and many people felt, that there would be less corruption. Uh, there was a conference committee that used to meet to, to well, similar to what goes on in the federal politics that would meet to discuss bills that might have been passed, similar bills that were passed in both houses, and then they would meet in secret and kind of come up with the final version, but nobody really had any more say in it, and nobody got to be there to testify or anything like that when they met. So he started campaigning the state to get an amendment to the Constitution that would be on the 1934 election ballot, and he was widely respected by people from both parties, and I think very revered by the people too. And they did get it on the election ballot, and the voters approved it by a very substantial margin. So that's how we came to have a you know, unicameral legislature. So when it was first started, they, uh, they could have had uh, anywhere between 30 and 50 legislative districts, because that was what the const new constitution provided for, but they chose to have 43. And it first convened in 1937. And Back in those days, they all just served two-year terms. So there were a lot more of them in those early years. And then in uh, 1964, they uh, 
they changed, they cha there was a constitutional amendment, and I'll go into s some of the nastiness about all that. There was quite a controversial period in the 1960s um, having to do with apportionment, uh, and there were some battles fought over that. But one thing that was not really controversial was uh, increasing the number of senators to 49 and having them serve four-year terms. So since 1966, all of our senators have served four-year terms. And uh, since, 19, since 2008, they have been term limited to two consecutive four-year sessions. But that doesn't mean you can't sit out for four years and run again. And we Nebraskans know very well that Senator Chambers is now back uh, because he sat out for four years and he's now been reelected. So um, as Alana has gone into in, in quite some detail, the same sort of thing. Um, we have a district search available. Oh. And were you going to talk about this or was I going to talk about it? I think I was yeah. going to talk about it in a little bit more detail. Is we do, if you were back at our main page with the drop down, you can search by legislative district. And just keep in mind that because of reapportionment, redistricting, the increase in the number of districts, you're going to find people that served in more than one district. Or you may be, you may search on somebody's name who's currently serving in, let's say, District 49, and you wonder, well, what happened to all the other people from 19, from District 49? The same person may have served in a different district. I'm not making myself very clear, but you might be Which, better doing a I name can cover search. That, uh, in one of my searches yeah. at the moment. Yeah. It, so, because when the reapportionment took place, some of the districts literally moved. I know one was, one district number used to be yeah. in the panhandle, now it's suddenly in the mm -hmm. eastern side of the state. And it, there's so. one in the northeast uh, part of the state where I, a senator actually had to sit out for two years because his he was redistricted out of his district. And he actually sat out for two years and then ran again uh, in a different district. He hadn't moved, but his district had sort of switched out from under him. Okay. I did want to talk a little bit about um, reapportionment in the 60s because it was such a, a big fight. And after the uh, unicameral was formed, for many years they continued to just use the same districts that they had had uh, back in the bicameral era with the 43 districts. Well, they did do, they passed some uh, um, amendments to the Constitution that allowed for reapportionment and to create those 49 districts. However, what it said in, their, in the Constitution was that they could consider um, geography as well as population. Now, you think about this is the era of the 60s, the Civil Rights Movement, all kinds of things were going on nationwide. We also had Lincoln and Omaha who would become very large cities and uh, people in those districts felt that they were underrepresented the way that it was being done then because it followed county boundaries. So you things were getting kind of out of whack with the representation by population. At any rate, this, con this constitutional amendment was passed by the voters which allowed them to consider both um, geography and population. Well, the U.S., there were lawsuits were filed and, and the federal courts ruled uh, basically that federal courts had jurisdiction over how states did their apportionment. So that was number one. And then uh, the Supreme Court weighed in uh, and passed a, some landmark legislation that we now think of as the one man, one vote edict, basically saying that you, ha you could base it only on population as, as, much, as much as possible your districts had to be based on population and not area or county boundary or something like that. But they also, because um, you can, if you look at the drop down further down, you see our district maps. The one that says 1962, I think is, that's the same map going back to the bicameral era. Nothing had changed with that one. They just kept going for all those years without doing any reapportionment since 1937. And then in 1964, we see another map. These are scanned out of the Nebraska Blue Book, by the way, where things have changed. We've now got the 49 districts. But with this one, they did go ahead and do their apportionment, partially considering the geography. So that got thrown out of court. But the court did said you 
did say you can go ahead and have your election in 1964 based on this apportionment that we don't agree with, but then you're going to have to go back and do another reapportionment before the next election. So then you see another map that says 1966-1970. So this is what they did because federal law was telling them they had to do it over again. So it was quite a battle. And uh, we do have a, a nice document that was prepared by the Legislative uh, Research Office of the Nebraska Legislature that if you really want to get into this, you get a chronological history of everything that happened between 1934 and 1966 having to do with apportionment. And uh, so I was talking to a friend the other day who was very interested in politics and old enough to remember this big fight in the 60s, and it really was quite a deal. And the terrible Terry Carpenter that uh, you saw the sample search for Mary from earlier was involved. Uh, he was of the point of view that geography should be considered, just so you know. <laughs> and I don't know if that's one of the reasons he's considered terrible Terry. But Anyway, um, do we have anything more we wanted to say? About this. Uh, you wanted to say now the apportionment changes every could oh, change right. every ten yep. years, correct? Right. Yep. So when you see the map that says nineteen seventy two there, we do a as you know, we do a, a big census every ten years, the decennial census. So what happens now is the first file that goes to the President of the United States and then to the states is a total population count that goes right down to um, election district level. And each state legislature is required by law to do a reapportionment then based on that new census data. So we've got these scanned maps from the blue books that you can look now they're starting to follow the years. 72 would be when they, the, the blue book where they came up with a new apportion, reapportionment probably in 1971 based on the 1970 census. And so it goes. And Alana has even found, you know, the, the bills that actually passed. It was printed on the maps. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. And then the final map at the very bottom, um, that one that says 2011, this is a direct link to um, the Unicameral's website where they have all kinds of, of maps there that will help you figure out what district and what senator and so on and so forth, and you can download these maps as well. So. Do we want to do some fun searching really quickly? I think do we so, have yeah. any questions, Krista, before we yes. maybe we... Um, so if anybody has any questions um, about anything that you've been shown, you can put that into the questions section of the GoToWebinar. Um, we do have a couple of suggestions that from when you asked earlier for okay, people that searches. Okay. Um, Laura Hess, who's at Stanton Public Library, says Stanton County is her county, so okay. she would want to see um, what comes up in there. Well, first of all, let's go to territorial counties and see if Stanton is, no, oh. it was not a territorial county. Um, like this one. Yeah. So, um, the one thing I will say about counties, um, especially if you use them in free text, is there sometimes it will come up, especially if it's mentioned in a note, but uh, sometimes it will not. So, um, I will um, type in Stanton County or Stanton, and yes, uh, it's coming up as a residence, uh, not necessarily as a county. Okay, any other questions? Um, Susie Dunn says that Bill Avery uh, serves her district. Okay, so what, what do we got for him? Let's try Bill Avery. There he is. He is in um, district, unicameral district number 28. And he's served continuously from 2007 to, to date. Nobody I think else he just got reelected. Uh, yes, I do believe he did. Um, any other questions? No, nothing has come in. If you have any other questions or any other things you want him to look up here, oh. um, let us know. One thing, I, uh, a few little search terms that um, we had fun with when we were uh, prepping for this broadcast was uh, various search terms that are in notes, um, especially if you type them into free text. Um, it's interesting what will come up. For example, um, the word appointed, if you just type that into free text in the notes, you will see that um, it 
it says appointed or elected to fill a vacancy. Mm -hmm. And any of those words, um, if I typed in elected or vacancy, um, all of these would have uh, popped up. Resigned is another word that comes up in the notes uh, if typed in. This one, 1935, resigned before term ended. There are actually quite a few of those. Um, it doesn't necessarily say, uh, if at all, um, what or why they resigned, but it does say resigned before term ended. Um, another one, unfortunately, um, the word died uh, when typed in. Uh, quite a few legislators died while in office. Uh, one that I was researching yesterday for um, something, Jerome Warner uh, served for a very long time, for 30 years, 32 years, uh, but unfortunately died uh, in 1997. So he died uh, at, towards the end of his term and then was uh, re appointed, um, his seat was appointed to someone else temporarily. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, and Beth's, I just couldn't resist. Yeah, uh, Beth's favorite search is removed, and um, especially during the bicameral and um, it seems to mostly be bicameral. Uh, there are there is one unicameral so far. And I was thinking there were some in the territorial as well. But, um, like, for example, John H. Taylor uh, replaced um, someone in this group, Frank Berman, John H. Butler, Levi Cox, and Joseph Crow were removed for, from office. And then their seats were filled by um, other people. So, um, unfortunately, it doesn't say, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting <laughs> to think about why were yeah. these people, yeah. The <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, well, I guess it's probably most of them were a vote recount of some sort, but maybe mm -hmm. there were some other even wilder things going on. Yes, there very well yeah. could have been. Um, the other one that I wanted to do real quick, just because I was having fun with this yesterday, was um, all of a sudden I'm going, oh, where's Waldo? <laughs> and <laughs> so I typed in Waldo, and not only do we have a, um, a first name of Waldo, but we also have Willard H. Waldo, um, who served uh, in the unicameral. This one I should just say, after a vote recount, there is a yes, Y on this one. That is, a, that is correct, yes. So lots of interesting tidbits in the notes, and uh, if anything, just go to the different areas of the searching that you can do. Type in various keywords, see what you come up with. I think you'll be surprised and, uh, at how much fun it is. Mm -hmm. We do have a question that just came in. Uh, Susie wants to know, can you search for information that tells you what committees a, sen a senator serves on? Is that something that's in here? That information is not included any regularly in any of the entries that I'm aware of. So That's mm -hmm. correct, yes. Um, uh, but yeah. just for fun, I did type in committee, and no, uh, it does not. So that's not something that this database did, would do. You'd go to the Unicameral's own website or something. Well, I think you'd have to go back through the old blue books. That's uh, right. So, um, now, what you could, remember, Olana showed you those brief biographies. It's possible, I'm, I'm not sure, that you could, if you knew the name of your guy, okay. and you, and you okay. did a search to find the, the time period, in other okay. words, which blue book you're likely to find that little brief biography in, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. might be able to read that and get some committee information. Mm -hmm. Guy or gal, I should say. Um, well, just for example, when I was um, researching Jerome Warner yesterday, he was in the, I'm going to say the 22nd. There he is. He was in the 25th district, and uh, yes, in the biographies, it does say chairman of the 65 Government and Military Affairs Committee, member of Labor and Education Committees, uh, chairman of the Legislative Council, and those biographies do um, list a little bit more detail. So that's a... 
Any other last minute? Oh, are you guys no. done? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to say it's last minute. Time's up. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Not a problem. Anybody have any last minute questions you want to toss out or have them look for anything? Or anything last wrap up that you guys want to do or need to? Well, we hope you find it helpful. And if you work in a library that, that where you have lots of genealogists contacting you, we, we think that'll be Mm. It'll be very helpful for genealogists and also hoping that it will be helpful for researchers, people just researching who served when and where. In yeah, Alaska. I was getting that a lot of people involved, interested in history and would think find this is just something to totally dive into and just get lost in, yeah. <laughs> and even kids doing school reports, I think will find mm -hmm. this very helpful. Definitely. Yep, if you're in citizenship, at least in the Lincoln Public Schools, you're required to take a citizenship class um, mm -hmm. in high school. And maybe this would help you if you had to find a history of everybody who'd searched, who'd lived in, who'd served in your district. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, it doesn't look like any last minute questions have come in urgently. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Alana, Beth, and Mary for doing this. I grab the microphone over here for myself. Um, so that will wrap it up for today's session. It was recorded, so we can always go back and watch it again later. Um, and actually, if you help me out here, just type in Encompass Live on there to bring up the website for. Yeah, I'll just bring it right up. Um, that no, the main page. Let's just try oh, this sorry. one. Okay. There we go. Yeah. All right. Okay, so that will wrap it up for today. So thank you very much for attending and learning all about the Nebraska legislature, um, more than just the database. <laughs> um, and I hope you join us next week. Um, next week is our monthly tech talk with Michael Sowers. Normally it is the last Wednesday of the month, but we've bumped it up one week this month um, due to scheduling issues. Other things are going on. We have a different session the last Monday, the last Wednesday of the month. So he will be on next week talking about narrate with the um, topic of narrating the OPAC. Um, how can storytelling and narrative analysis improve the user friendliness of the online public access catalog, OPAC? Um, and we will have Mark Shane Scale online from us. He is originally from Jamaica. He is up in Canada right now. He is a PhD student in library and information science at um, Western University in Ontario, and he's been doing research on the OPAC, so he's going to be joining Michael next week to talk about what he's learned about that. So I hope you will join us for that next week. And we are, it's not working right. There we go. And Compass Live is on Facebook. So if you are a Facebook user, hopefully it'll come up. <laughs> um, you can like our page on Facebook and you'll get notifications of when we have anything new coming up, when recordings are available, when new episodes have been added, reminders of the upcoming shows. And Facebook has been very slow. Trust me, we're there. All right, we'll just get rid of it. Never mind. We are on Facebook. Use the link. <laughs> if Facebook isn't being slow, we can go there. So um, thank you very much for joining us today, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.